All right, so we're going to go ahead and start. So this training is going to be about fire and the basics about fire. Uh, we're going to go up over everything pretty much. And um, if you have any questions, you can give me a call later on and I can explain or, or expand a little bit more about anything that you might want to know. <clears throat> All right, we're going to cover the fire suppression agents, fire release, and MNS systems. I'm going to go over uh, basic fire panels, um, devices that you can connect to them, configuration, uh, different features that the panels have, and at the end we're going to cover a little bit of MNS notification and also agent release. So why do you need a fire alarm panel? Well, you need a fire alarm panel because of uh, changes in occupancy, for example. Uh, not every Every uh, building will need a fire alarm if you make changes in, inside the building, if you change the configuration of the, of the cubicles, if you change the common areas. Everything where people is going to be located and uh, is going to be a common area, you will need fire detection pretty much. Any remodeling that you do or any um, new construction in the building will also need a fire alarm system. <clears throat> the fire alarm systems are driven by code compliance officers, the need of, of um, a fire system due to new codes standardized over the years, American Disability Acts or ADA, which require an, a fire alarm system in buildings where you're going to have people living that has disabilities such as uh, handicapped or um, that they need some type of alert when there's a fire in the building, and also insurance agencies. Uh, it's a big liability for insurances that you don't have a fire system in your building because if, uh, in, in case of a fire, you will lose pretty much everything. I mean, all the uh, records, papers, uh, hardware, um, computers, everything will be lost, and those are or need to be covered by the, by the insurance. And that, that can be a lot of money. So that's why you, the fire alarm, it's required per insurance for uh, commercial buildings and also uh, some type of um, restaurants, hospitals, and, and sometimes even residential when it's a uh, bigger um, a big house or some house that is going to be hosting um, or having a, an office inside it. <clears throat> Where do you need a fire alarm building? You need a fire alarm building in, in applications such as this ones that you see here, auditoriums, banks, uh, server rooms, a dry storage, daycares, kitchens and food service facilities, labs, medical facilities. All those need a fire alarm system to be able to announce when, in case of a fire or to evacuate people that way you can prevent damages and also life, life safety. <clears throat> in industry applications we have meeting rooms, nursing rooms, offices, pharmacies, schools, shops and strip malls. Um, if you walk around in any, any mall or any place like this you will see that there's always detectors, always um, fire alarm in place in order to prevent um, life losses. When you're talking to one of your dealers and uh, you explain to them, look, uh, fire alarm system is something that you need to have in this application that you're doing in these buildings, um, you will have, you also can expand to them or talk to them about the beyond installation. Beyond installation means that the fire alarm needs to be or must be, some of them, monitored. They also have to have um, they also have to be monitored to be able to report to the central station and in case of a fire, in case of a supervisory or a trouble that might have been happening or if any detector is damaged or needs to be replaced. Also, the dealers can benefit from, from monitoring because they can get revenue out of this. Uh, roughly, a central station will charge per a dealer $15 a month and if you multiply that times 12 months, it will be $100, $180 a year that they will charge. And the dealers will typically um, charge the customer around $30 a month. So that, that means that over the course of a year they can be making $180 profit or revenue from, from a fire alarm system per account. If you have, let's say, uh, two accounts, you're making $360 in revenue a year. So that is, is revenue that, that they can have from installing a fire system and also uh, providing the, the monitoring for the, for the fire panel. Another thing that they can benefit of is uh, the service contracts. In a fire system, most of the times, 
every year a detector has to be either cleaned or replaced. Uh, batteries and some sensors have to be changed. There are going to be changes in the building where there's going to be new construction or uh, they're going to mm, put new cubicles or organize the people differently. And uh, those building changes require the change in a change in a fire alarm. Also, um, if there's construction or there's construction going on, they need to relocate the devices to be able to uh, provide notification in case of a fire. And uh, building additions such as parking lots or a second floor also requires a fire alarm building, a fire alarm in system in place. <clears throat> Another thing that the fire alarms um, dealers might be interested of is the annual revenue or, or, or an income every year for doing an annual inspection. Uh, dealers will typically charge $100, $200 for, a, for an annual in a, in a fire system, depending on how big the, big the project is. You know, in an annual system, what the dealer will do is he will walk around, around the building, put the fire alarm on test, and go and test all the detectors and make sure that the detectors are working. They will test the pool stations, te test the detectors, test um, the notification appliances, and make sure that everything is working as a system in case of a fire, that it will perform well. So fire alarm systems, um, you might have seen this before. They have some um, standards. Uh, the first one is going to be the ADA standard, which is the American with Disabilities Act, the UL on the right-hand slabs, NFPA 72, which is your National Fire Protection Association, the ANSI, um, American Nat National Standards, and some building codes. Uh, those building codes and all these standards are what drive the, the, the fire alarm specifications, and uh, most of the systems either are FM or UL listed. This means that it, they will pass inspections um, when the inspector goes at the end of the installation, and uh, using these standards, they will say, "Okay, this is per code, this is all correctly per code," and uh, they will they will pretty much issue the the code. Um, it's, it's like a, a paper that says, "Okay, the certification for the fire alarm system." Over the past years, we have seen a market growth in the need of fire alarm system. This is due to the code enforcement getting stricter. Also. Um, a lot of places require nowadays mass notifications to be able to announce weather problems or weather um, coming in or anything uh, related with with a mass notification like an evacuation or something like that. Also, the need of uh, service maintenance. Um, the 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 dealers are taking advantage of this and installing more fire systems just because of the revenue that they're getting from testing and and maintaining a fire alarm system. Um, the more attractive price, the price has gone down in fire systems and, and also the new technologies such as the wireless alarm uh, solution where they don't need to, to wire cables to the buildings or to the different devices. Everything can be done wirelessly. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about some, uh, some specific terminology. And if you guys are not familiar with the terminology in, in fire, uh, the left-hand side column is the one that we're going to talk about the most or I'm going to mention the most. This is going to be your FICP, which is the Fire Alarm Control Panel, um, your FCC, which is the Federal Communication Commission, uh, NFPA, AHJ, which is the authority having jurisdiction. Mm, if you keep going down the list, we're going to see the IDC or SLC, uh, a NAC, and an offline resistor, as, as an SLC, which is a signal in line circuit. But if you guys need to know more about this termi terminology, you can go to the URL that is on the bottom. And that will give you a complete list of, of um, terminology that you might hear in the in the business, or if a customer sends you an email with something that you don't understand or what does it mean, you can look it up in that uh, pretty much a dictionary of terms for fire alarms. So, what is a fire alarm system? Well, a fire alarm system is just a system that that monitors and uh, announces fire alarms. So it can do a fire alarm, a supervisory, a sensor, travels, and uh, Ultimately, it can evacuate and prevent the, the life of, of a person being lost. Um, so we, we sell a, a bar, variety of, of uh, systems here, um, silent light, um, fire light, and we have notifications as a system sensor, copy notifications. We have uh, different um, vendors that we can uh, source for fire alarm systems. And at the end of the presentation, we're going to talk about them a little bit, and I'm going to show you the differences between them. <clears throat> so, FACP, a fire alarm control panel. 
Well, this pretty much is the brains, the brains of the fire system. It connects all the, all the components, all the detectors are going to be connected to your FACP. Uh, this includes the smokes, the heats, the pool stations, um, different sensors that will be able to uh, be controlled through the fire alarm control panel. So the fire alarm control panel will get all these detections and it will, based on what he, um, of the programming of the fire panel, it will either notify a supervisory, an alarm, or a trouble. And uh, also it can do, perform a lot on other duties, like for example, um, they have a, a relay to be able to do some automation uh, with access control to release the doors. You can turn on fans in, in staircases. You, you can um, open dampers per floor. Uh, you can do elevator recalls. So everything will be controlled by the FACP, the, your fire alarm control panel. The fire alarm control panel is also going to be connected to um, a central station via a DAC, a new DAC. So the DAC is a digital alarm communicating transmitter that uh, basically what it does is just transmit the information to a central station over the telephone or, or the internet and it just reports the status of the fire panel. So it just tells the, the central station, hey look, this fire panel is okay, there is no problems happening right now and uh, the minute that something happens it will report to the central station and you can dispatch a fire truck to the building in case of a fire and um, you can also call the, the tenant and tell him, hey, is everything okay, is, is there a fire going on? And uh, also a central station can also uh, tell the dealers, hey, there is a sensor that is reporting um, dirty, so you might want to go check it out. Um, the DACs, they come either integrated in the motherboard of the fire panel or in some uh, panels you will have to buy it separate. Also remember that the central station, in order to get the signals, it needs to have a receiver and the receiver needs to be talking the same language as the, as the UDAC of the fire panel. <clears throat> This, this DAX that we see on the, on the um, screen are uh, the phone um, UDAX. This uh, phone, the phone lines will, con will connect to them and you need to have a redundant phone line, so pretty much two lines per fire panel and they will use the phone line to call the, the, the fire station, the central station. But we also have the IP communicators. So IP communicators increase the security, um, increase the supervision time, it also decreases the, the transmission time and uh, with some vendors it can be used to upload and download information from the panel. So internet has become a more reliable way of sending uh, notifications to a central station and it can be faster uh, than, than, it will be faster than your phone lines, than your regular phone lines. So every single fire panel that you sell will have the UDAC, will have the notification, will have the, the devices uh, connected to the fire panel but all fire panels are different. When we compare fire panels, we have four types. We have the conventional fire panel, which is your conventional analog. Then you have your addressable fire panel. You have your intelligent addressable fire panel and your combination, or a hybrid of both. So the ones that we, we're going to cover the most here are going to be your addressable panels and also your, your intelligent addressable. The difference between addressable and intelligent addressable is that intelligent addressable panels will be able to uh, read the, the sens sensitivity of the sensors, so it will tell you if there's a sensor that is dirty or if there's um, a sensor that needs to be replaced. Also, intelligent addressable panels um, will give you a graph of how the connection of the sensors is. So once you do the configuration of the panel, you can use the, the software that comes with the fire system and you can pull um, a diagram which will show you the connection of, this, of the detectors, either in, um, in PIC, con using pigtails or just um, daisy chaining from sensor to sensor. So this can be very helpful for troubleshootings uh, of a ground, a ground in the system or a trouble in the system. You can easily just look at the graph, at the diagram, and it tells you, okay, um, maybe uh, detector number, I don't know, 10 is damaged. So you can see the graph um, and see where the detector number 10 is installed in the, in the building. So in addressable fire systems, they are um, easy to install, they are very easy to maintain. Uh, when there is a trouble, it's very easy, easy with, a, with an addressable system to just pinpoint where the trouble is, uh, go maybe disconnect the loop and find the, the ground of the system. Um, it pretty much will tell you if there is a faulty device and where is it and what type of trouble does the device have. So you can always do isolation of the loops with, a, with an addressable system and then you will be able to find where the trouble is. 
it's also very easy to, to test. Um, basically, you just uh, walk around the building and test each one of the detectors, and you can, uh, with a walkie-talkie or some type of announcement device, you can tell the, the person that is on the other line uh, to check off the detector numbers that are being tested and they're reporting OK. Uh, it's very easy to diagnose and resolve problems. You can easily just look at the panel or the annunciator and see, okay, detector number 10, 12, 11 um, is damaged or it's reporting a, a trouble. And it's also always monitoring the sensitivity of the circuits. So it's always uh, showing you what the, the status of the sensors are. <clears throat> so in a panel, you have um, inputs and you have outputs. In inputs, you're going to be connecting to the SLC line or to the IDC line if it's an analog system. But you're going to connect, connect detectors, pool stations, uh, supervisory switches, smoke detectors, heat detectors, and so on. All these inputs are the ones that are going to be telling the fire panel the status of the building or the status of the place where the fire alarm is connected. They're going to be telling uh, the fire panel, if there is something wrong, go ahead and send an alarm or send a trouble. Usually, a fire panel will wait for two sensors to be um, tripped in order to report a fire or something like that. When there is, um, that's in, in the automatic sensors. So automatic sensors will wait for two, so two smokes or, or one heat and, and smoke. Um, in manual stations, every single time you pull a manual st station, the fire alarm will go to, to alarm. So in automatic, the fire alarm will be able to, to detect if it's a trouble or fire based on how many sensors are being tripped. In an analog system, we talk about the IDC, or your initiating device circuit. So this circuit is either with automatic or with manual initiating devices, and uh, we refer to it as an IDC. The same term in an addressable system is called an SLC, a signal inline circuit. So uh, that's the main difference between an analog and an SLC when you're talking about terms, IDC and SLC. Now, um, towards the end, we're going to go over the different vendors, and I'm going to show you in the SLC line, how many uh, devices can you connect to them in the different panels that we sell. <clears throat> it's important to pinpoint that in an addressable system, um, the panel will pretty much tell you the, the, the status of the system. So the panel will tell you all the time, the time, what time it is, if there is a, a trouble, if there is a, an alarm, or if there's a supervisory per uh, sensor. So this is very easy and very convenient for installers to look at and say, okay, there is something going on in the smoke detector number, I don't know, 140 in this case, in the loop one. So you see on the bottom right of the of the screen, it says I 1D140. That means the first loop detector number 140. So you just look at the graph and it will tell you where the detector is located and you just replace it or or, or fix it if there is any if you can fix it. <clears throat> so in this picture it's pretty easy to you guys to understand how um, they, the, the inputs are connected to a fire panel. So the inputs are connected to a fire panel in an IDC, in, an address, in a conventional panel, or an SLC in an addressable panel, as I said before. They can be connected as a class A style Z, or they can be connected as a class B style Y. So class A or class B, the only difference between them is that class A provides a redundancy on the fire panel. So think of it as a, as a double way or double line connected to the panel. So in case one uh, side of the line gets stripped, the other line will be still active and be able to detect fires or detect troubles. Uh, class A provides redundancy to the system. Um, and also class A is required sometimes for, for um, some certain type of buildings to be able to have a redundant system and prevent a fire uh, in case of one. So you can see that you have uh, on your monitors, you're going to have your relays, your, your control modules, and on the detector side, you're going to have your smokes, your heats, your docks, your beam detectors, and also the manual, the manual pool stations. When we talk about automatic fire detectors uh, compared versus the manual fire detectors, automatic detectors are the ones that you don't need to activate yourself the per, or, or a person in order to trip the panel. So automatic fire detections, detectors are um, your uh, smoke detectors that they can be either photoelectric or they can be a light scattering technology or they can be a beam detector which uh, means a light obscuring technology. They can be an ionization smoke detector. 
Also, you can have heat detectors and duct detectors that will go install in the, in the AC return, return lines. So when we talk about the, 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 the one that you're going to see the most, which is going to be your smoke detector, the photoelectric smoke detector, this photoelectric smoke detector uses uh, light scattering technology. So uh, they, have, they will have an emitting diode, an LED, that sends the beam of light through a chamber and and if there is a smoke in the chamber, it will um, it will bounce back to the, to the sensor, which is on the other side. So I'm going to show you a picture, so it's going to be easier to understand. On the right-hand side, you're going to see the LED, and on the left-hand side, you see the sensor. This will be covered and completely dark, and whenever there is a smoke inside the um, chamber, it will bounce back. So the light emitting diode here is on the left-hand side, it's always uh, sending a, a signal, and um, the sensing chamber is in the center and the diode on the other side is the one that's detecting the scattering of the of the light. So that's why when you're testing a smoke pan, a smoke sensor, you can spray it with um with a testing smoke and uh, that will simulate this this thing happening inside the, the sensor. So um sometimes the, the the color of the smoke can affect the, the reflectivity. So Remember, blacks will absorb more light than whites, so that the color of the smoke will also delay the, um, the tripping of the panel sometimes. In the sense, in the second automatic sensor, which was going to be your light obscuring type, which is the beam detectors, basically what this does is that if there is, in case of a fire, the fire will, um, the smoke of the fire will prevent the light going from the beam detector go to the reflector. So the reflector is going to be installed on the other side and they're always going to be communicating between the beam and the detector on the other side. When there is smoke or, or, or um, something interrupting that, that line, that path, it will trip the fire alarm panel. <clears throat> In your ionization smoke detectors, um, they contain a small amount of, um, of a radio radioactive material and um, this material is in this uh, plates inside the sensor in a, in a place called the metal chamber. Uh, so ionization will, re, uh, be, will generate a steady electrical current and the particles of the smoke that are entering the chamber will disrupt the current and then trigger the detector as an alarm. So ionization detectors, um, they require power going through this um, metals and when there is a smoke you will trip the fire alarm because there is um, a radioactive material between them. Ionization detectors also need to be replaced once they're tripped so they, they, they some of them they can be um, used two or three times but uh, in an ion detector they need to be replaced to be more reliable and also the benefit of an ion detector is that it will react more quickly uh, to fast flashing fires. So if you have a location where you have a, fl a fast flash fire or, or any type of combustion device, um, that will trip more quickly than a smoke detector. The ion detector will trip quicker, quicker than uh, a uh, um, smoke detector on the photoelectric, using a photoelectric chamber. When you have a dot detector, these ones are going to be installed in the return line of the, of the AC and they need something called a sampling tube. So the sampling tubes are the, the tubes that you see on the right hand side. They are they come in different sizes and these tubes they go inside the return lines and they have a testing tube, the sampling tube, and the one in the back which is the return tube. So when the AC is pulling air uh, through the return line, it will go through these little holes on the tube on the right hand side or, or the bottom of the picture on the right and um, these little holes will go through the sensor which is on the other side. If you see on the, on the left hand side of the picture there's a sensor where you, that's where you put a regular smoke detector and then um, the air will circulate through that sensor and in case of a smoke being detected through the uh, AC return it will, it will trip the, the fire alarm system. Now sometimes these devices are considered uh, to be a supervisory uh, because an AC will not always be turned on. So if the AC is not going to be running all the time, there is not going to be any sampling being taken uh, by the smoke detector, by the dock detector. 
Okay, so you might have heard about the two wire and four wire smoke detectors. Well, the only difference between them is that a, a two wire uses the SLC uh, for power and also for announcing or sending signals to the panel. A four wire smoke detectors they will have the uh, power separate from the um, from the SLC or the IEC. In this picture, we can clearly see how um, the power is coming from a from a secondary source. So the power, the 24 volts, are coming to, from two wires from a power supply, and this power supply needs to be um, a UL listed or FM listed to be able to have the whole system under under uh, code. So that's the only difference between a two wire and a, and a four wire detector. Now, when we go to um, the manual initiating devices, we're talking about the manual pull stations. So manual initiating devices are the ones that will trip the panel automatically. These are devices that need to be pulled or tripped by a person in order to generate a signal on the fire alarm panel. So in a manual um, pull station, we have uh, three types. We have the single action, which is the one that only requir requires a single uh, Okay, we have the single action, which is the one that only requires um, a single operation to activate, which is either pulling or pushing sometimes in a downward action. In a dual action, pull stations are required in places where you're going to have kids or where you're going to have um, problem zones like a mall where there are going to be kids running around and maybe playing with the pull stations. They require two operations at one time in order to um, activate. So these ones are, for example, the um, pushing and then pulling, or pushing and then um, pulling down the, the pull station in order to activate in the panel. Uh, a break glass, they're not being used as much, but they're required in a, they're, they're, they're not, they cannot be installed in an ADA system, you know, for people with uh, disabilities. But uh, these ones will have a, piece of glass in the middle, which is a thin rod of glass that needs to be replaced every time the, uh, the, the glass is broken. But um, they are kind of a double action, but they just need to be, the glass needs to be broken in for the, the fire alarm to trip. <clears throat> we also have, um, the pull stations can also be with uh, keys to be open, be able to be open and reset. Um, they come in different languages, um, and they have uh, either plastic. There can be either plastic of or metallic, and either indoor or outdoor. So I'm going to show you uh, some pictures of a dual um, action manual pull station. As you can see, you, it says fire on the top. This can be in different languages. Also, you see the the um, the actuator, which is the actual moving part of the pull station. And since this is a double action pull station, you're going to need to push and then pull down in order to activate the alarm. In the back of this manual pull stations, you're going to have the addressable module. So in this addressable module, you're going to use the, the dial of the tens and the ones to be able to give an address to this um, monitor module, which is the pull station. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little, a little bit about the heat detectors. Um, heat detectors. It's an automatic sensing device, and um, they can range. They you can you can have different types. You can have the fixed detector, you can have the rate of rise detector, or you can have a rate compensation compensation detector. So the fixed detector, uh, you can buy it in two common ones, which are 135 or 200 degrees. So if you buy this one, in order for that heat detector to trip, the temperature has to be either 135 or 200, depending on which one you buy. Uh, the rate of rise heat detector, what it does is that it has um, it, it has an algorithm built in the in the sensor that it requires that there is a temperature rise, and in that rise needs to be an allowable of in in a, in inside a range. So it will have a range of temperatures built in the in the sensor, and that that temperature cannot increase. Um, so if the temperature increases quickly, the temperature the sensor will trip. So this rate of rise sensor will be always measuring the temperature, how the temperature rise inside the sensor, and if it if it goes up too quickly, it will go ahead and trip. But if it's a steady uh, temperature raise, it will not trip. 
up to certain, certain um, temperature. And a rate compensation temperature, it will always respond regard, regardless of the rate of the rate of the temperature rise. So this uh, rate compensation sensor is similar to the rate the rate of rise detectors. The only thing the only difference is that is on is always measuring only one um, one uh, like exponential increase of temperature rather than the rate of rise detector which is measuring different uh, raises of the temperature. In a rate compensation heat detectors, those are like the ones in the picture to the right. This um, rate of rise, this rate compensation heat temperatures, they come uh, like a little stick um, and that stick is like a thermometer that's going to be installed in the outdoors. So this, this heat detector can be installed in, uh, in places where there is uh, weather or water and um, the temperature responds really quickly to heat changes. This temperature is, is very quickly to heat changes and uh, if there is an increase on heat it will go ahead and trip. <clears throat> heat detectors, they have the slowest, the, the lowest false alarm rate of all automatic fire detector devices. The, um, also, the heat detectors are used in applications such as kitchens or um, places where there's a lot of, of uh, smoke, uh, places like um, an elev elevator uh, shaft, they will require heat detectors in order to detect if there is a, a fire or, or a temperature uh, rise inside the, that, that um, elevator shaft. So they're not the quickest devices to report a fire. They, they have a delay on the system. But um, they're usable in applications where smoke detectors will report a false alarm. So they, they, they need to be used in places where the smoke detector is not going to be code compliant. We also have another type of uh, heat sensing cable, which is a cable that will go installed around the buildings or around the perimeter of a building. And pretty much what it does is that it's always communicating to the panel and when the protective insulation of the actuators will melt, it will report to the panel. <clears throat> this uh, heat sensitive cable um, uses current in the wires that are separated with a heat insulation and when the temperature um, goes up, this insulation will melt and it will soften and the temperature increase will allow the electrical current to send a notification to the panel of a heat rise. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about notification on the panels. So uh, all the outputs of the panels are going to be connected to your NAC, to your notification appliance circuit. Or it can also be connected to a booster power supply, which is um, an additional component of a power system which will provide more power or more current for additional uh, notification devices. So your notification devices are going to be your sounder bases, uh, your speakers, horns, and strobes. So basically anything that will be able to notify people in case of a fire or in case of or, or, or to prevent people for, from dying inside the building or preventing a, um, a liability. So the first one we're going to talk about is going to be your strobes. So in the, in the strobes we have um, so you have different notification appliances. You have the horns, bells, sounders, sirens, speakers. Uh, visually, you have your strobes. Physically, you have your bed shakers. And smell, you have um, an olfactory. You have your your smell sensor, uh, smell notifications. So the ones that are more the most common ones are going to be your horns, your horn um, strobe, horn strobes, your speakers. Uh, sounder bases and bells. The last two you probably haven't heard of, but these are required in places where they have um, people with disabilities, uh, such as the bed shaker and the smell. Um, the smell, I have seen them installed in places where they have blind people or uh, people that uh, will not have a condition that they cannot uh, see some, uh, or react. They, they can react to um, flashes of light with the strobe. 
So instead of having the flashing devices or the or the strobe lights installed in the building, they installed the smell um, notifications. <clears throat> so we're going to cover the different audible devices. So an audible device is the first one is your bell. The bell will typically be installed outside where the PIV and the backflow is. And the bell, the only thing that is going to be announcing will be that the fire sprink sprinklers are being triggered. So the, once the bell is running, that means the fire sprinklers or any type of agent is being um, um, sprayed in the, inside the building to, to turn off a fire. Uh, the horns are a loud output. They have distinctive noises, and they're um, used in a locations that they have a lot of noise. They're a really loud devices that um, will provide different um, noises that you can set. With a dip switch, you can configure them in the back. The one that is uh, used the most is called the siren high-low tone, which is going to be a really loud noise generated by the piezo inside the, the sounder or the horns. Then you have your, your sounder, which is um, devi a device which is capable of producing a variety of tones. These tones, the one that is being used the most is your code 3 tone, which is the temp high and low, or also the slope whoop. So this, this uh, temp high and low is the one that I have heard the most, um, is the one that is being used by every single uh, ARP alarm panel. But also can, uh, you can change that to a slow uh, whoop on the, um, on the sounders. Um, chimes, well these ones are so soft tone devices. These ones are being used uh, where it's disruptive to to uh, put a really loud noise inside the build, inside the, the, um, the place where the, the chime is installed. So these are being, you can install these ones instead of sounder based in sounders or horns um, and they're generally uh, a device that will produ produce a softer tone, so it's going to be um, better for the person working in a, in a quiet zone or something like that. Uh, a horn can scare or can sometimes be uh, a really loud noise that can disrupt the operation of the building. <clears throat> you also have your sirens. These ones are extremely loud devices, so sirens are only being used, you can only install them outdoor and in heavy industrial areas. So a siren is, is, is pretty loud. It can produce up to 127 decibels at 100 feet away. So those are pretty loud. And then you have your speakers. Well, speakers, um, you will install a speaker in a fire panel to be able to wor um, work in conjunction with an uh, evacuation system. So an evac system will be installed alongside of the fire alarm panel to be able to give guided instructions of the people living in the building. In your visual signaling appliances, you have your strobes. So the strobes are just appliances that are installed in either in the walls or the ceilings of a, of a common area to be able to notify people in case of a fire or in case of, um, of they, need, they need to leave the premises. In the visual devices, you have your uh, strobes, you have your horn strobes, and you have your speaker strobes, and they come in different configurations, either wall-mounted or ceiling-mounted. And also, you have selectable candelas in the back. So you can have a 15, a 1575, 30, 75, a 110. Those are called multi-purpose um, candela outputs. Then you have your high candela outputs, which are uh, 135, 150, 177, and 185. <clears throat> they operate in, a different, in different ranges. They, they can do either 12 volts or 24 volts and uh, also are offered either by itself as a strobe or also as a horn strobe combination. <clears throat> so now we're going to get into supplementary functions of the fire panel. <clears throat> In the fire panel, most of them will have a Form C relay. A Form C relay can be used to do certain type of, of uh, functions and um, you can integrate the, the, uh, the relay with access control panels or um, CCTV systems or any type of input that the other system can receive to be able to generate an elevator recall, a dog detector, or a damper to open a damper, to turn on a fan, to turn on the extinguishing or the suppression system, um, or sometimes to turn on the lights of the whole building to be able to give um, guided 
assistance to live in the property. <clears throat> Every single fire alarm panel requires a, a LCD or a annunciator installed if the fire panel is not installed by the door. So if the fire panel is installed by the door, you will not need an annunciator. An annunciator is a device that will notify a person as soon as they walk into the building um, the condition of the fire panel. So you can do every single um, silence, reset, or acknowledge from the annunciator, and this will be able to provide the, um, the firemen, the, the, fireman, uh, the conditions of the panel when they, con they come in through a, a building on fire. So this is required by code, and you have different types of, type of annunciators. You have your zone annunciator, you have your LCD annunciator, which is the most common one. You have a graphic annunciator, uh, a complex remote annunciator, and the, uh, the remote annunciator, the regular one that you see in the pictures. <clears throat> um, the ones that we're going to use the most, or the ones that you're going to see the most, are going to be your LCD uh, crystal display annunciator. Those come in different colors. Connection was lost for a little bit. All right. Um, the type of, of alarms that you can see in an annunciator are going to be your alarm signal, which indicates an emergency that requires immediate att attention, your supervisory signal that indicates the need of an action uh, with an off normal condition, and also a trouble signal, which indicates a fault in a circuit or a component. When we talk about the sprinkler uh, systems, um, a sprinkler system will look like the one in the picture. These are the pumps and the valves inside the sprinklers. And a sprinkler system requires a valve to be able to provide supervision of the lines. So the, the one that we see in the, in the right-hand side is going to be your, um, your flow switch. This uh, has that uh, plastic piece on the bottom that will activate the sensor inside when there, whenever there is flow of water inside the pipe. <clears throat> they are installed like this in the, in the pipe. And uh, the only thing that they're doing is once the fire sprinkler is activated, it will provide a supervisory signal to the panel saying there's water flow inside the pipe. There's a short video here um, showing how the showing how the sprinkler is activated. So as you can see, the sprinkler, some people think that the sprinkler is activated with the panel. Well, the sprinkler is a separate system to the fire alarm panel. The sprinkler activates uh, when there is a fire, and that fire melts the red rod inside the sprinkler head. Once this, this plastic piece has been um, melted, it will with the pressure of the water, it will just start um, the water flow, and then the switch will tell the panel there is a water flow inside the building, and then trip the alarm. So a fire sprinkler system is a is a system that is running independently, independent from the from the fire alarm panel, and is being supervised via supervisory switches or supervisory uh, water flows installed in the in the pipes. <clears throat> um, Sometimes you might be asked if we, we sell any type of fire alarm agent release panels. So fire alarm agent release panels are panels that are in charge of the releasing of certain um, agents to be able to turn off a fire. So these agents can be halen or can be different. Oops. Let me see the video here. So as you can see in this video, um, there's an agent which is a foam agent inside the hanger and um, once the, the agent is running or the, the system is running you have a uh, time by code is going to be 15 seconds to turn off that, that uh, water supply to the, to the foam generators. Um, typically when you have an agent release panel you're going to have an agent stop um, pool stations or an agent release pool stations. So as you can see in the video, once the foam being is being, um, once the system trips, 
there is no way to stop it. You have 15 seconds at the beginning when we strip to to turn off or to stop the the phone of if there's an accidental um, if, if it's an accident. <clears throat> so what classes of fire? Well, you have your different classes. You have A, B, C, D, and K. Uh, an A class will be any fire caused by a trash, wood, paper, or cloth. And the type of extinguisher that you're going to need is going to be water or a foam or any dry chemical inside a fire extinguisher. Then you have your B class, which are the oils, grease, gasoline, gasoline, paints, and thinners. These ones will require a carbon dioxide to turn it on, off, uh, halen, or any dry chemical in a, in a liquid form. So you can use a dry chemical or a liquid forming fo form. Then you have your electricity, which is going to be any electrical equipment that catches on fire, and you can turn up turn this off with CO2, halen, and any dry chemical. Uh, you have your magnesium and titanium, that's the class D. You will need dry powder um, that is suitable for the combustion material. And then you have your cooking oils, animal fats, and vegetable fats, and you can turn this off with any wet chemical like potassium acetate base. So now, um, it's almost the last slide here. We're going to cover the firelight and silenite panels which are the ones that we sell the most. In Firelight, you have the MS9050UD. That's a single loop, uh, 50 points addressable panel with an integrated uh, DAC system. You have uh, one NAC, you have two NAC circuits of 2.5 amps max with NAC synchronization, and you can have up to eight annunciators on this panel. It also has two relay outputs to connect to any type of um, panel that can work in conjunction conjunction with this uh, power panel. Then the second one on the, on the, the, in the middle is going to be your MS9200 UDLS. LS stands for Light Speed Technology. And you have a single loop with a maximum of 198 addressable points. It has an integrated duct. Um, also provides four NAC outputs of maximum three, three amps, NAC synchroniz synchronization, and two relay outputs. Uh, additional to the to the 9050, you have your detector sensitivity. Uh, so you will tell the panel how dirty the sensors are. Um, the big one on the right hand side is going to be the MS9600 UDLS. This one provides up to 318 addressable points, or you can have an SLC-2 to increment that to 636 total. You also have your integrated DACT. Uh, this, this panel also features an auto program feature that pretty much whenever the, everything is installed, you just hit auto program and you will find every single detector connected to the panel. It has two relay outputs, a four NAC um, synchronized circuits of a maximum of six amps, detector sensitivity, and it has a remote, remote it can do remote upload and download from a central station or from a computer. <clears throat> uh, when we go to the silent night line, you have the SK5600, that's the smallest one, and it's a hybrid system. In this one, you have an integrated DAC, NAC synchronization, and only one NAC with two amps output. Um, the one in the middle is an SK5700. You can have up to 50 addressable points, integrated NAC, in, in, integrated DAC, um, three, two, I'm sorry, one uh, NAC circuit of 2.5 amps and three relay outputs. Um, the one on the right is the SK5808. You can have up to 127 addressable points, integrated DAC, auto program, NAC synchronization of six amps, and three relay outputs. And then the biggest ones of all are going to be your SK5820XL. This one goes up to 198 SK protocol. Um, and it can be expandable to 792 using the, and then 508 using the SD protocol. So you can expand to 792 using the SK protocol and 508 using the SD protocol. Integrated that, it has a NAC output of six amps and a three, re three relay output. Also, 
this this panel has something called a flex foot circuit. So the flex foot can be anything you want it to be. So you can put um, in a flex foot, you can use it as an input or you can use it as an output or you can use it as a relay. And the last one is going to be the SK5820XL-EVS. Uh, this additional to the SK5820XL uh, will also provide you to um, the option to put up to 50, up to 450 watts or 425 watts with a maximum of 500 watts to be able to do mass notification and uh, you can record 15 one minute messages on this panel. <clears throat> and uh, that's pretty much it. So if you guys have any questions, um, let me know. Or you can call me and I will answer all your questions. Thank you.